Hello and welcome to part 3 of our discussion on bonds. This video will walk you through an example of how to account for bonds from start to finish. After watching this video, you will be able to prepare an amortization schedule, be able to record all journal entries for the company that borrows the money and the investor that loans the money, and be able to record the early repayment of a bond. Let's walk through an example together. Kit's company issued a bond with a bond contract that started on January 1st. Cash was not actually exchanged between the company and the investor until March 1st. When the cash is exchanged does not change the bond contract. The bond begins on January 1 and ends 10 years from January 1. Please pause the video and take a moment to write down the terms of the bond that are noted in red. 100,000 maturity value stated rate of 8%, an effective rate of 7%, and interest is paid twice a year on January 1st and June 30th. You will notice that the company's year end is not on a bond date. We will need to refer to the, to the terms of the bond as we go through this example. The first thing that must be done is compute the price of the bond. The price is not given in the example, so we will have to compute the present value of cash flows. Take a moment and notice how the cash payment for interest is computed. It's the maturity value times the stated rate divided by the number of payments per year. $4,000 must be paid every six months. Pause the video and use your present value tables to locate the present value factors. The number of total periods is 20 and the interest rate for six months is 3.5 percent. We will use the present value factors to compute the price of the bond. The price of the bond is 107,107 on January 1st. The next step is to prepare the amortization schedule. First, write the bond dates down the left side. Bond dates are dates stated in the bond contract. Leave room to insert rows for transactions that occur on a date that is not a bond date. Write the column headings across the top. Interest expense, stated interest, the difference, and the amount owed. We will not use a column for a premium or a discount. Start the table on the far right with the amount of cash that would have been exchanged on January 1st, the start of the bond contract. This is the present value of the cash flows for the full 10 years. The present value of the bond is more than the maturity value and the bond was issued at a premium. The effective interest for six months is 3.5 percent. Multiply 3.5 percent by the 107,107 to get the first six months interest expense. Put the amount of cash that will be paid each period in the stated interest column. Compute the difference and subtract the difference from the amount owed. More cash is paid for interest than interest expense. The additional amount is subtracted from the amount owed. Remember, the amount owed must move towards the maturity value of 100,000. Repeat the steps for the next January 1st row. Multiply 3.5% by the last amount owed on 630 of 106,856 to get the interest expense for the second six month period. After completing a couple of rows that have bond dates, insert a row for each of the other dates that a transaction occurred. A row is needed for March 1st for the actual issue date and a row is needed for the year end of October 31st. Let's first add the 3-1 row. Determine the number of months that have passed since the bond date on the row before it. The row before it is January 1st and two months have passed between January 1st and March 1st. The 3-1 row will represent two months of interest. Take the interest on the bond row after 3-1, which is the 630 row, and multiply the 3,749 by two months out of the six month period to get the 1,250 for, for the interest expense. Repeat this for the stated interest column. 
2 out of 6 months times 4,000 is equal to 1,333. Take the difference between the interest expense and the stated interest and subtract it from the premium in the amount owed to get the amount owed on March 1st. Do the same for the 1031 row. The time pass between the last bond date on June 30th and October 31st is four months. Multiply the row after the October 31st row by 4 6 to get the numbers for the October 31st row. Please pause the video and rewrite the amortization table. Recalculate the numbers on each row. You will need the amortization table with all the amounts to prepare the journal entries that we will do next. Take a few minutes and prepare the table. We will do journal entries for the company, which is the issuer first. You should have your amortization table in front of you to use to see where the amounts come from. Please continue to write the entries as we go through them, or pause and write them down. Writing them down will help you understand what is happening. The first entry to record is the issuance of the bond. Issuing the bond just means the money was borrowed. We will record the credits before we do the debits. First, record the entry for the liability. The bond's payable. The amount recorded is the amount in the carrying value, or the amount owed column, on the date the bond is actually issued, on March 1st. The cash was exchanged on March 1st and the, mar and the amount owed is the March 1st amount. Second, record the amount of interest for the two months that have passed before the bond was actually issued. The amount that would have been paid is 1,333. This is from the stated column. Do not record the effective interest amount. No interest was actually incurred before the money was received on March 1st. The last thing to record is the cash received. It is the total of the two credits. The cash received is not shown on the amortization schedule. The second entry we will make is for the next bond date, which happens to be the first interest payment. First record the cash paid. The cash paid is always for the full amount of the stated rate for six months, regardless of when the bond was actually issued or any other transaction. Cash paid is stated in the bond contract and does not change for any reason. The second thing to record is the debit to interest payable. The cash payment pays the interest payable from March 1st. The amount debited is the amount that was previously recorded. Next, record the interest expense for the four months that has passed since the last entry was recorded. This amount is computed from the six month number on the June 30th row of 3,749 less the two-month number 1,249 on the March 1st row. The amount for six months less the amount for two months is the amount for the four months that passed from March 1st to June 30th. Adjust the bond payable for four months using the same process. Subtract the two-month number of 83 from the six-month number of 251 to get the amount of 168 that represents four months. The bond payable needs to decrease to get to the maturity value, so it is a debit. The journal entry should be in balance if you have recorded the correct amount of time for each piece. Notice that when there is a row in between the bond row dates, the journal entry after the extra row will include four lines. The extra line is for the accrued interest from the row that was not on the bond date. The last entry presented is for the year end accrual. The next row on the table. This entry records the interest expense from the last payment date until year, year end. No cash is paid on October 31st because it is not a payment date. This entry records amounts for four months since the last journal entry was made. The amounts on the row all represent four months. Record the amounts on the amortization table for the October 31st row. 
when there is no row in between the bond dates, the amounts recorded are the amounts on the row. When there is an extra row in between the bond date rows, the amounts recorded is the amounts on the bond row less the amounts that are on the extra row that was inserted. The journal entries for the investor are for the same amounts as the company, the issuer. The accounts used are different. We will use asset accounts and income accounts. Investment in bonds is used instead of bonds payable. Interest receivable is used instead of interest payable. Interest revenue is used instead of interest expense. The amounts are for the same time period, so the amounts are the same. Take a moment and notice the differences in the entries for the investor and the entries for the issuer. A company may repay the debt early before the maturity date. A company will want to repay the debt early if the company can borrow again at a lower interest rate. The investor may want to be repaid early if they can reinvest in a bond with a higher interest rate. The bond contract will state that the bond can be repaid early and who decides if they can repay early. The first step is to insert a row into the amortization table for the date the bond is repaid. Use the same procedures that we just discussed. The second step is to record interest expense and the cash to pay the interest up to this date. Cash is credited for the agreed upon amount. The bond payable is debited for the amount of the carrying value column on the date the bond is repaid. A gain or loss is recorded to balance the journal entry. Gains are credits, losses are debits. Repaying a bond early normally results in a gain or a loss that is reported on the income statement. After viewing this video, you should be able to prepare an amortization schedule and add rows for all transaction dates. You should be able to record all the journal entries related to a bond for the company that borrows the money and the investor that loans the money. You should also be able to record the early repayment of a bond. This concludes our discussion on bonds payable. We have covered a lot of material and you will need to do some practice. Please work through the easy test on studymyaccounting.com before coming to class. Thank you for being prepared for class. Your hard work will pay off and it is very much appreciated.